So we come to Matthew chapter 14. Uh, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these spas are at work in him. So now we know that John had uh, beheaded John, uh, Herod had beheaded John the Baptist. And now when he hears about Jesus, he is uh, a little afraid because he knows that he's done something terribly wrong. And now uh, when he sees somebody like John, even greater than John, he is now really perplexed and he is filled with fear. So now the reason why he is afraid, we see now Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So we can clearly see that Herod committed adultery. And although his wife was still alive, he marries another woman, his own brother's wife. And uh, John uh, very clearly, openly told him what you're doing is wrong. And uh, because of this, John was punished. He was thrown into prison and finally he had to face death. And uh, you know, when, when you do something wrong and you are powerful, you want to eliminate the one who is kind of uh, pointing a finger at you and telling you that you are in the wrong. You know, you can kill the person, but you can't kill your conscience. So his conscience is still disturbing him, but then it will go on disturbing him and uh, he will have a very miserable death finally. Uh, the story is that, you know, uh, he goes to Rome one day and he meets his brother's wife and there he seduces her and finally they get together and they come back to Galilee. And uh, this lady is also a very sinful, loose woman. And uh, she is also very angry with John because he is saying things like this, that they are doing something wrong. Herod is also not happy. So, uh, then what happens later is that uh, uh, Herod will lose his place. He will be sent to Gaul into exile. He will go into exile. And finally, he will die there in exile. So, he will have a very miserable life in the end, towards the end of his life. Anyway, that's the story about Herod. So, what he does now is, Though he wanted to put John to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. So Herod also wanted to eliminate him. But now he did not know how to go ahead because he was afraid of the people. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod. Now you see, Herodias is a wicked woman. And what is worse is that she also incites her daughter to get into this. You see, the princess usually will never dance in front of all these cheap fellows because Herod's guests, they're all very low class fellows and allowing the princess to go and dance before them, normally a king will not do. But then this woman being a loose woman, having a plan, she allows her to dance because this girl Seems to be a very attractive girl and he wants to use her. She wants to use her own daughter as a ploy to get something done from the king. So that is her motive. And so Herodias allows her daughter to dance before Herod's guests. So Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Okay, so with that, uh, the story of John is over. So, Herod thinks, you know, 
he will now be free from this botheration because somebody is going on pointing a finger at him. But then, of course, his conscience will still continue to pick him. So now the disciples of Jesus, uh, sorry, the disciples of John, these disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place apart. You see, Jesus is also human. And when he hears that his cousin, no, his first cousin is dead and he has had such a terrible death, Jesus obviously is affected and he wants to just go away to a lonely place. But he cannot. When the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. See, he goes in a boat and everybody can see at a distance that the boat where Jesus is traveling is slowly going towards another shore and they run on ahead. Okay, they run on ahead on foot and somehow they make it to the other shore before Jesus reaches. So as he went ashore, he saw a great throng and he had compassion on them and healed the sick. This verse is very important. I think, uh, you know, we need to look at this uh, for us when we sometimes are in ministry, when you're doing some work or wherever we are. You know, just when we want to take a break, you know, suddenly you have a guest. Suddenly you have someone who wants to talk to you. You know, we think, okay, this person is a nuisance. This person is a pain. Why is he or she coming and disturbing me now just when I want to lie down? Just when I want to relax? But look at Jesus. He had compassion on them. See, Jesus wants a break. He wants to be a part in a lonely place. But the people, when they come and they come looking for him, Jesus doesn't get upset or angry. He doesn't say, hey, go away, leave me alone. He doesn't say that. He had compassion on them and he heals the sick. Not one word from Jesus, no complaint, but rather compassion. So compassion instead of complaint. And he heals all the sick people. And another sad thing is that, you see, uh, these people, they come to Jesus because they want something. Once they get what they want, they just go away. You know, once their favor is received, they just leave. They don't uh, want to really serve Jesus. They don't want to show their gratitude. It's not mentioned, you know, people just come. And now, of course, there are many people who are coming and they're going to listen to him. So when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a lonely place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. So these people who have come in great numbers, they're all there. And Jesus is probably giving them a long discourse. And at the end of it, as it is getting dark, the disciples now think, oh, yo, yo, if you know these fellows stay, then we must get them food and all that. So it's a problem. So best send them away. So they tell Jesus, please send them away. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. You see, so that becomes you know, a big headache for the disciples. So they think, what do we do? Where do we have food? So finally they find out and then they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. That's all we have. So when we come to Jesus with just a small piece of what we have, just a small uh, something, a small something for Jesus, he is able to multiply it. That's what we're going to see. He said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. Notice that Jesus will not give the bread. So Jesus just gives it to his disciples. They in turn, uh, they distribute it to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. Imagine, 
uh, it's a huge crowd of 5000 men besides women and children but they all ate and were satisfied and they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over how do they get 12 baskets because there were 12 disciples 12 apostles so each one had a basket and see god is generous at the same time god does not want us to waste food so that is why they collect all the broken pieces left over okay. and those who ate were about 5000 men besides women and children so maybe about 7000 people or more and yet with just five loaves and two fish jesus is able to do a wonderful miracle so this is something so spectacular that all the four evangelists have mentioned this in the gospel and mark has mentioned two such instances so the multiplication of the loaves is something uh, fantastic that jesus did and when the people saw this miracle, you know, they wanted to crown him king. That is what we see in the Gospel of John. And if they do that, there will be a big riot. And so, what does Jesus do? He made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. Very important here. Why, you know, the disciples too are worldly now. They also think of Jesus as the King Messiah, that he is going to become the Messiah like they expect, a political Messiah. And so they will also incite the people to make Jesus King and there will definitely be a riot. And so Jesus first sends the disciples away in a boat. And then he is able to dismiss the crowds. He can manage the crowds because... They are simple people, whereas the disciples will go and incite the people and, you know, say, you know, yes, Jesus, you have to become the king. So they may create a riot. And so Jesus is now dismissing the crowds. He is sending them away. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was many furlongs distant from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. So, the people have eaten and have gone, and uh, now the boat is against the wind. It's traveling, but it's against the wind, and the disciples are fighting, and now it is night, and then it goes on and on and on and then in the fourth watch which means three o'clock in the morning at three o'clock in the morning when you know when there is just very little light you know very little light you can only see a silhouette you can only see an outline fourth watch of the night jesus came to them walking on the sea but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea they were terrified saying it is a ghost and they cried out of fear so jesus walking on the sea uh, probably it appeared that he was walking on the sea no he did walk on the sea why because we know peter also tries to walk when he, they see jesus you see they cried out for fear when they saw jesus but immediately he spoke to them saying Take heart, it is I, have no fear. So Jesus immediately, uh, he says, don't worry, I am there for you. So Jesus takes away their fear immediately. They are able to recognize the voice of the shepherd. You see, and Peter answered him. You see, Peter is always someone who, you know, immediately wants to say something. So he says, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you on the water. I do not know if Peter was really uh, understanding what he was saying. But he just wanted to blurt out something. So he says, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter should have 
believed Jesus and gone. But what happened? Peter got into the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Peter ventures out in faith. He begins well. But then what happened? He saw the wind and he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O man of little faith, why did you doubt? So this is also our nature. You know, we step in to the water, believing that Jesus will be with us. But then when we look at the situation outside around us, you know, the situation seems to be bleak, seems to be very bad, very negative, very different from what we imagine it to be. And we are filled with fear. So that is what happens to Peter. Although Jesus gives him the command to walk on the water and gives him the grace to walk on the water and the power to walk on the water, Peter, because of his fear, because of what he sees around him, he is afraid and he begins to sink. Now you and I can also be in the same situation. But Jesus gives us his grace and he gives us all the strength we need to walk with him. But then we are surrounded by temptation, surrounded by fears, surrounded by the world that we can begin to sink and think, oh Lord, where are you? I'm sinking. Not realizing that Jesus is close at hand and he is the one who gives me the strength to walk. So the moment I... I'm filled with fear. Moment I doubt, I begin to sink. Now I begin to lose control of what I'm doing. And what does Jesus say? He immediately comes out. He reaches out his hand and catches him. He says, a oh, man of little faith, why did you doubt? If Peter had not doubted and continued to walk, he would not have sunk. Because he doubted, because of his fear, he sinks. So it's the same for us. When we walk in faith, we will not be shaken. But the moment we begin to doubt, all kinds of uh, things begin to happen to us. But the beauty is Jesus is close at hand. And he reaches out to us. You see, Jesus takes the initiative. He reaches out to him and catches him. And when they got into the boat, that is when Jesus and Peter got into the boat, the wind ceased. The moment Jesus enters the boat, the wind ceases. And those in the boat worshipped him saying, truly you are the son of God. See, they had already seen Jesus perform this miracle. They already want to crown him king. Now when they see him, you know, having power over nature, you know, they are stunned. You know, because all night they've been suffering with the wind. You know, the moment Jesus steps in, there's a calm. And they worship him, saying, you are the son of God. You know, this must have been a real experience for them to, you know, worship him in the boat like this. If it was some ordinary person, you know, they wouldn't have done this. But for Jesus to stop the wind, you know, it must have been a terrible experience for them all night. And the moment Jesus steps in, the calm must have been so powerful, you know. That the people are really stunned. Saying, wow, you know, how come he has this power over nature? And they worship him. See, worship is given only to God. And they worship him. And when they had crossed over, they came to land at Janasareth. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent round to all that region and brought to him all that were sick and besought him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. See? So beautiful. That people have tremendous faith in Jesus. They just want to touch the fringe of his garment. And they believe that you know, they will be healed. And sure enough, all of them are healed. Everybody who came to Jesus was healed. Without an exception. Everyone was healed. And as many as touched him were made well. See? 
So that is the crowd, you know, that is the people. Now you see, on the one hand, simple people filled with faith. On the other hand, now we are going to see the Pharisees and scribes who are always against Jesus, always up in arms against Jesus, wanting to oppose him. Why? Because he is so jealous, jealous of him. Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Is this so important? Yes, for them it is so important. No, they want to find some silly excuse. And for them the law, upholding the law is so important. You know, Moses gave only 10 commandments. But over time it became 633 laws and bylaws. You can imagine how there was a law for everything. And so you had to be so careful, you know. You have to really think, am I doing the right thing or not? Am I sinning or not? You know, so filled with the fear within your heart, living as a Jew. You know, am I doing the right thing? Am I pleasing God? Am I sinning? This is predominant in their minds. It was so, such a burden for them. That is why St. Paul, you know, will say this. You know? When Jesus came, once the grace came, the law is gone, you know. If you believe in Jesus, that's enough. You know, don't cling on to the law. Otherwise, the law is killing you. It says the law kills. The law is only killing us, you know, keeping the law. Am I transgressing? One small thing and I've transgressed the law. So why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? It doesn't say why do they transgress the law of Moses? No. Transgress the tradition of the elders. He answered them, and why do you transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Fantastic. You see, Jesus goes one step higher. He's saying you're talking about tradition which was given by human beings, by your forefathers. But then, by keeping your tradition, why are you for, uh, foregoing the commandment of God? You're transgressing the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition. For God commanded Honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. That is, they call it korban. If you read the gospel of Mark, the word korban is used. <coughs> For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. So beautiful. You see, Jesus is filled with wisdom. And that is how he is able to immediately, you know, able to give them scripture for scripture and say, look, this is what the word of God says. And see what you have done. You have reduced it to nothing. Such a powerful commandment of God about honoring your parents. You have reduced it to nothing when you say, you know, what you would have gained from me has been given to God. That means I become a sacrifice. Then I don't have to take care of my parents. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So he says, all your worship is all useless. You know, it is only lip service. In your hearts, you don't worship me. So with that, he shuts their mouth. You see, they are not able to say anything. They will just walk away. The, the scribes and Pharisees, you know, they came to attack Jesus with such force. But when Jesus asked, asked them this question and told them this, they've gone away. Not a word from them. And so I called the people to him and said, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. You see, Jesus is very open. He's very... You know, so brave. 
He is able to defy the Pharisees and then when his disciples say they were angry with you, he says, don't worry. He says, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. You know, what courage, what guts Jesus has to speak like this. No, He knows they will kill him when he speaks like this and yet he will not stop speaking. He says, let them alone. They are blind guides. See how he talks about them. <coughs> Jesus knows the truth. He knows these fellows are hypocrites. They are only trying to find fault. But they themselves are not genuine. They are not uh, good people. Just leave them alone. No, they are not guides at all. They are blind guides. And if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. But Peter does not leave Jesus. No, because Jesus had said about uh, what goes in and what comes out. And so he says, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Verse 16, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and so passes on? So it goes into the excreta. So what goes into your mouth doesn't go into your heart. It goes into the stomach and it goes into the excreta. That is all. It doesn't affect your heart. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. See, the other way around, what comes from the mouth doesn't come from the stomach. It comes from the heart. And this defiles a man. You see? So when you say something, what you say comes from the heart. Whereas what, what you eat doesn't go to the heart. It goes only to the stomach. So that is something Jesus beautifully explains. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So clear, Jesus. So eating something does not corrupt us. What corrupts us is our thoughts. And our thoughts, they become words. And those words are a sign that my heart is impure. So mind what you speak. Be careful of your words. Because your words will clearly indicate what your heart is like. So if your heart is impure, it will show in your words. That is what Jesus is saying. Verse 21, Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. So Jesus is leaving Palestine and he is going away to Lebanon. Lebanon is what we call Tyre and Sidon. So he goes to a foreign country. He goes to a neighboring country very close by. So they are all very close. So <coughs> he goes to Tyre and Sidon. <coughs> and behold, a Canaanite woman from that region, came out and cried, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. I really wonder how this lady is able to address him as Lord, as son of David. That means she knows who Jesus is and is familiar with Jesus to be able to recognize him. That means Jesus has either visited this place several times or she has seen Jesus in Palestine. She has met him before, met him in the sense she has seen him, at least at a distance, and has uh, probably seen him speak or seen him heal. So she knows Jesus. She knows that he is a wonderful rabbi. He is very powerful. So she addresses him as son of David. That is the Messiah. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him saying, send her away for she is crying after us. See, Jesus, when he does this, he wants to explain something. He wants his disciples also to understand something. So, you look at Jesus. He knows the woman is a woman of tremendous faith. Okay. So, Jesus doesn't talk to her. It seems to be ignoring her. 
But Jesus knows the heart of every person. He knows this is not a woman who is to just take no for an answer. So she will come after Jesus. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says, Don't, why do you come to me? I was not sent for you. I was not sent for foreigners, not for the Canaanites. I was sent for the Jews. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not fair to take the children's bed, bread and throw it to the dogs. See, she calls... See, dogs are Gentiles. The Gentiles are referred to as dogs. They're pet animals, you know. It's not a bad derogatory word. It's the word that is used for pets. So given to the dogs here refers to the pets. So Jesus is just playing with her, as it were. You know, trying to tease her. You know, she knows that Jesus is not very serious. Jesus is not that kind of a rabbi. He is just teasing her and she understands that. That is why she said, yes, Lord, that even the dogs, the house dogs, or the pets, eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. See, she is able to answer back to Jesus. Give him tit for tat. Whatever Jesus is saying, she is able to answer back. So here is a woman who is really, you know, very genuine and who has real faith. And Jesus is... Uh, taking a deeper and deeper, you know, and she's exercising her faith in action. That is why Jesus answered her, Oh woman, great is your faith. One of the most beautiful words from the mouth of Jesus, acknowledging this woman's faith. He says, Oh woman, great is your faith. You know, you know just a few minutes ago, we read how Jesus tells Peter, Oh man of little faith, his own apostle, his own leader of the apostles. He tells him, O man of little faith. But here he looks at this Canaanite woman and he says, O woman, great is your faith. You know, Peter must have been there and he must have heard these words. And the other disciples have also been there. And they're all around Jesus. They know this woman is torturing Jesus. And when Jesus says these words, you know, it must have come like a shock for them. O oh, woman, great is your faith. And my master is saying, I am a man of little faith. You know, Peter must have thought. But this is a lesson for them. They are learning. See, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Beautiful, no? Tremendous faith for this woman. You no, know, she is not someone who will take no for an answer. It's not someone who will be discouraged by what Jesus is saying. No. Until her quest is resolved, until her problem is resolved, she will not leave Jesus. Fantastic. No. And Jesus appreciates her. He says, wonderful. Wow. He says, what a woman of faith you are. You no. Know, so therefore, I am blessing you. Therefore, don't worry. You know, whatever you ask will be done for you. Be it done for you as you desire. Your daughter was healed instantly. Remote control again. <coughs> the daughter is not here. The daughter is somewhere at home. But the woman alone comes and pleads. And Jesus is able to heal and she believes. And when she goes back home, her daughter will be well. The daughter is healed instantly. Jesus went on from there and passed along the Sea of Galilee. And he went up on the mountain and sat down there. You already saw Jesus going up the mountain, you know, going up to pray. But again we see now Jesus going up the mountain. So this is a routine for Jesus. He wanted to be alone with the Father. And whenever he wanted to pray, he would go up the mountain and he would just sit down there. And what happened? People, when they see Jesus wherever he is in the open, they come to him. Great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the maimed, the blind, the dumb and many others. And they put them at his feet and he healed them so that the throng wondered when they saw the dumb speaking, the maimed whole, the lame walking 
blind seeing and they glorified the God of Israel. It was something very beautiful you notice. You know, the people, when they see Jesus doing all this, they glorify God. They don't glorify Jesus. They glorify the God of Israel. So you remember, they recognize that Jesus is acting on behalf of God. And all the glory goes to God. Jesus doesn't take any of this glory to himself. He directs it to the Father. And that is why he makes no attention, doesn't draw any attraction to himself at all. Because by the way he is working, people recognize that this is coming from God. You say today, many healers, many people who are in the miracle ministry, you know, they have a name. You know, people run after them as if they have that power. You know, the glory doesn't really go to God. The glory goes to all these people. You know, they are the ones who are talking and saying, you know, give me this, give me that. I want uh, money for my projects. I want funding. And uh, there are people funding them. Why? Because they take all the glory. But you look at Jesus. How beautiful he is able to do so many miracles, perform so many healings. And yet the people glorified the God of Israel. So beautiful to see Jesus, you know, not taking any of this glory and, you know, offering all that to the Father and uh, making sure that the people recognize that this is the work of God, not him doing all this. And so we have here the second miracle now very soon. He, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd. Because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And his disciples said to him, Where are we to get bread enough in the desert to feed so great a crowd? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven and a few small fish. Commanding the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciple to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied, and they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. So this time there were not twelve but seven. Those who ate were four thousand men, not five thousand. This time it was four thousand men, besides women and children. And sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. You know, it is as if a repetition of what we just read earlier. We just read something very similar earlier, just that uh, the numbers were slightly different. Otherwise, the details are exactly the same. You know, people coming there, Jesus having compassion on them. The disciples want to send them away. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And then there are some, some bread and fish. And then Jesus uh, gives it to his disciples after blessing it and then they dis distribute it and then they collect baskets. So every time they collect the leftovers and then Jesus sending away the crowd. You see, Jesus will send the crowds away. So till they are gone, Jesus will be there. And after sending them away, he goes into the region of Magadan. So, I'll just stop with this today. We'll continue next week. Okay. Any questions?